When he gets to the White House, President Ronald Reagan will have to make some crucial choices as to where to spend the billions he vows need be spent to refurbish and modernize America's arsenal. Chemical warfare, chemical weapons, got almost no attention from any candidate during the presidential campaign. Chemical warfare conjures up visions of soldiers hit by poison gas, retching and gasping in the trenches in World War I. But chemical warfare today is more sophisticated. Its principal weapon is nerve gas, a kind of human pesticide that paralyzes the central nervous system and kills with sinister swiftness. Top U.S. commanders today assert that the Russians plan to use chemicals if war should come. And President Carter has ordered a study of our military's capacity to defend against chemical attack and, if necessary, to retaliate in kind. But when 60 Minutes asked the White House and the State Department for on-the-record interviews on U.S. chemical warfare policy, they refused, as did top Pentagon officials. But they would let us talk with the troops in the field and their commanders. The men of the U.S. 11th Armored Cavalry are on the front line in West Germany. Their commander, Colonel John Sherman Crow. So East Germany is about 100 yards from here. Almost exactly 100 yards from here. And you genuinely expect that if there were an attack, there would be an attack with chemical weapons? Without a doubt. They will fire both conventional and chemicals. There's not a doubt in my mind about that. And you believe that for a while anyway, you can defend against chemical attack? Very definitely. Very definitely. A dawn alert at the barracks of the U.S. 11th Armored Cavalry in West Germany. This exercise was put on for us, but the unit has similar surprise alerts at least once a month. The soldiers take this exercise with deadly seriousness. For if an attack from the forces of the Warsaw Pact ever comes, and many of the troops stationed here are convinced it will, this unit would be one of the first to be bloody. They move to positions in a forest overlooking a possible Soviet invasion route. The men wear special boots and suits to protect against chemical and biological weapons. They fix tape to their uniforms that will change color in case of chemical attack. Sensors are laid out to warn of the approach of any chemical cloud. Now comes word that Soviet armor is rolling toward them. The 50th Motorized Rifle Regiment is advancing from the east to the west, approximately 20 to 30 K. Suddenly, the attack begins. Real poison gas is colorless and odorless. But for training purposes, the Army often uses tear gas, or in this case, smoke. Chemical warfare is nothing more, Mr. Wallace, than uh, an added dimension to the conventional battlefield. If you're able to protect yourself, then you'll survive on the battlefield. This regiment today, the 11th Cavalry Regiment, will survive on a chemical environment. But when you say we'll survive, you don't mean to say that you're not going to take any casualties I, under chemical attack from the other side. I would never be that... Uh, uh, Much of I a guess. damn fool. That's right. <laughs> Colonel, you expect casualties. I expect casualties. How severe? I would hope we wouldn't get more than uh, 10 to 20 percent casualties from a chemical attack. Forces of the Soviets and their allies during Warsaw Pact exercises. Those Americans who are convinced of a Soviet chemical threat point out that for years now the Soviets have equipped and trained their forces to be able to fight on a chemical battlefield. They also, we are told, have an awesome arsenal of chemical munitions. They have some 300,000 to 700,000 tons of chemical agents. They have the capability, uh, the weapon systems, to deliver those weapons throughout our area here in Europe out to a range of some 800 kilometers. Colonel Bill Cook is the top U.S. chemical officer in Western Europe. The American public, you believe, does not sufficiently understand the chemical threat in Western Europe? I don't think that the American public has understood the chemical warfare threat for many, many years, as a matter of fact. Airplanes did drop gas on these villages? But the American public has heard charges from refugees that the Soviets and their allies may have recently employed chemical weapons. We heard reports like that ourselves from Hmong tribesmen who had been driven from their homes in Laos by Vietnamese troops, largely supplied by the Soviets. 
Look like it's more rainy. Look like rainy. Looks like rain coming yes. down? Yes. Was anybody hurt? Did anybody uh, get dizzy or vomit or die? More. More of it, Jolene. 20 people dead by the gas. 20 yes. people killed by the gas? And in Afghanistan, Dan Rather and other reporters have heard similar charges from refugees since the Soviets invaded that country. But it is not at all clear that if chemicals are being used in Afghanistan, that they are lethal. He says, what I can be sure of is that there was a smell, and then when, when that happened, we were all unconscious for about half an hour. I don't know. In Afghanistan. When they cross that border, though, Mr. Wallace, that's World War III. And uh, they're going to use everything they've got available, in my view. Look. I can see a Soviet colonel sitting here and telling me the same thing if he were given permission. We're never going to go first. Mm -hmm. We're only going to retaliate. We've built up our forces because we think that you people, you Americans, intend to use chemical weapons. Don't you believe that that's exactly what he'd say to me? It probably is. And I submit to you that that's probably so much propaganda. How do you feel about chemical weapons, Sergeant Ford? Chemical weapons? Honest. It's a fear of the unknown. I know what... Obama's going to do when it hits the ground. Loud noise, shrapnel. But chemical agents, you're fearing something that's colorless, odorless, tasteless. You don't know what it's like. I guess it's something that an American soldier will always fear. I think war is horrible, killing people is horrible, but I see nothing inherently less moral about chemical than grenades that blow people in half. Amaretta Hober is a defense expert who has done several studies for the Pentagon on chemical warfare. She says that while a few forward-based troops, like Colonel Crow's 11th Armored, may be in fairly good shape, most American units are not. Today, we do not have an adequate defense against Soviet use of chemicals, in addition to which we do almost no training in chemical warfare. In other words, if there were a chemical attack at this moment in Western Germany by the Soviets, we could not properly defend ourselves. That's correct. We're playing catch-up to the Soviets, correct? Absolutely. They're serious and we're not. Oh, we're just... No, we are very serious at this point. Up until this last year, there was no one in the Department of Defense who was charged with the chemical warfare responsibility. How come? No one thought it was important enough, in my view. I well, mean, literally, they did not have anyone who had that responsibility. We have had benign neglect over the years, but I am totally satisfied that we're on the right road now. We just need a lot of support. One problem that especially worries many U.S. experts is how to evacuate and treat the injured in a chemical war. We absolutely just have no real experience on those requirements, medical requirements, for chemical casualties. The U.S. did have some experience with mustard and chlorine gas during World War I, but never with nerve gas. Just a small drop on the skin, or inhaled, can kill within minutes. As soon as he's assaulted by the first symptoms of nerve gas, as in this simulated exercise, the American soldier has an injector, which he can immediately use to treat himself with atropine, a powerful antidote to nerve agent. The problem is that while that atropine may save his life, it will itself knock the man out of action. I think for all practical purposes, you can consider him uh, uh, out of duty uh, probably for at least a week. Another problem, the protective masks themselves. If you're here and you want a drink, you want mm -hmm. something to eat, you want to go to the bathroom, mm -hmm. uh, but, you, but you can't get out of that decontamination equipment, what uh -huh. do you do? Well, uh, you want a drink. Our canteens are fitted with a device for drinking. Okay. Where, where does it... You have to feel for it, huh? Well, it could get pretty thirsty that yeah, way. Yeah, sure can. <laughs> I take your word for it. Yeah. You, you, have a, you, have a you open right something up in there. It opens up, and then you slide this on top of your, your canteen right here. Mm-hmm. You up it up, take a drink. Okay. After you turn, you take a drink. Now, you're a fellow. I, I don't mean to embarrass you about this, but you've trained at considerable yes, length with this yes, and still couldn't find it momentarily. Momentarily, yes. So it's... You can see how tough it is for a soldier to have to operate under those conditions, and particularly if there's combat going on around him. Absolutely. It can be confusing. 
But it's worse than confusing if, like many of our troops, you've got a mask that has no drinking tube. So what do you do if you need a drink? Uh, that's a very good question. I guess I just don't drink. You don't drink. <laughs> you can't eat, right? Right. Can't go to the bathroom. Right. And you're going to fight under those conditions? Well, maybe a good 24 hours, yes. We're going to still fight the battle for at least that long. Those protective chemical suits also have a very limited life. So even if the battle is still raging, sooner or later, the troops will have to find some uncontaminated spot to clean off, both themselves and, just as important, their equipment. But this decontamination requires a lot of especially trained men and machinery. And here, say most experts, the Soviets are far ahead. You're fighting a modern war with antediluvian uh, tactics, as far as chemical war is concerned. In many cases, that's absolutely true, and we are striving to change that. If attacked with chemicals, the Army can at least move its operations. But the Air Force is tied to its bases, which makes them a prime chemical target. This is the Wing Command Post with Alarm Black. Special instructions are don masks and field gear. A simulated chemical alert at the sprawling American air base at Ramstein, West Germany, just 10 minutes flying time by jet fighter from the East German border. Pilots are sheathed in special gear to protect them from both chemical and biological weapons. This may look like a science fiction film, but in fact, if war comes, these men fully expect to perform their missions in chemical gear. Some chemicals persist only for a few minutes or hours. But there are other so-called persistent agents that, depending upon the weather, would force the men and women at Ramstein to work in a chemical environment for days or even weeks on end. And as things now stand, the people at Ramstein just don't have that capability. For example, this emergency runway repair crew at Ramstein. Their American-made clothing is supposedly better than the Soviets have. But hot weather can still turn their gear into a stifling portable sauna. During a recent similar exercise at Ramstein, on a hot day, after only a couple of hours, six of the 20-man crew collapsed from exhaustion. In the event of chemical attack, there is a specially protected American command post at Ramstein. Colonel Robert Colclasier, in charge of disaster preparedness for the U.S. Air Force in Europe, gave us a look inside. The attack is on, and it's run from inside here. For this wing, yes, it's run from right here. How long can this thing operate? <coughs> well, based upon the water and rations that are stored, it, uh, probably in excess of 30 days. All buttoned up, and they stay in here? All buttoned up in here. All very impressive, and a few similar shelters are under construction at Ramstein. But right now, there are 10,000 men and women at Ramstein, and only three such chemical-proof buildings. That'll take care of how many of the 10,000? Well, I would say conservatively 500. 500 out you of 10,000? You might get in the three buildings. The rest of the people would continue to operate in the dirty environment until such time as they could no longer work here. Then we would have to withdraw them from the confines of the base or the confines of the chemical cloud. Yet you can't get the money for the building to protect your own personnel? That has been the problem. One of those buildings at Ramstein without filters to protect it from chemicals is a vital one, the control tower. Therefore, if an attack came, the controllers would have to put on their masks. And that's the catch-22. For with the mask on, the controller's vision is restricted. But more important, he can no longer communicate clearly with the aircraft. If that is true, Sergeant, then uh, given a chemical wartime situation, how are you going to control your aircraft? Because you have to have this on. I really don't know. The firemen at Ramstein, as they demonstrated to us, they're a Cracker Jack outfit. Usually they wear special heat resistant suits. But in the event of a chemical attack, they would have to switch to chemical gear. The problem is that that gear is not heat resistant, which means that the firemen would not be able to enter a burning building or plane to rescue the people trapped inside. Have you been trained to fight a fire in an airplane? 
in a chemical warfare environment? No, sir. How come? That's, um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is the first time I've had to suit, this suit in particular on. I've had my gas mask and everything, but I've never had the suit on. So this is the first time that you've had any, this was done in effect for us then? Yes, sir. Okay, everybody's gonna take their mask off in a couple seconds. Once a year, most of the people based at Ramstein try out their masks in a small room filled with tear gas. If you want, take your mask off now. They also get occasional lectures and alerts. But many of the people serving here feel that because of a lack of equipment and training time, they are just not prepared to meet and survive a chemical attack. How recently have you had your suit on, your anti-chemical equipment? I've never had it on. How many times have you had your uh, suit on? Never. You ever tried to put those anti-chemical boots on? No. We have sufficient to give everybody one suit, one mask, one ensemble. Uh, beyond that, uh, we would like some more additional equipment. Wouldn't last in case of war. That's correct. You're not prepared for it? In my opinion, no. And not trained for, really? My opinion, not really. Most standard estimates are that everyone in the Soviet Armed Forces gets several weeks' worth of chemical warfare training a year. Uh, we simply don't do that with our people. That's my first real priority. We've got to get better defended. At the Army's Chemical Research Laboratory in Maryland, researchers are working on everything from special flares to warn of a chemical attack to more versatile, lightweight gas masks. Over the next few years, such new gear will be going to troops. But many of the soldiers in the field say that the best way to deter a Soviet chemical attack would be for the U.S. to be able to retaliate in kind, to force the Soviets to fight in the same chemical mire as the Americans would have to. I would certainly like to make him just as miserable as he can make me. In the Army, uh, we feel that it is, in fact, just another weapon as far as the Soviets are concerned. It should be treated as only another weapon system as far as we're concerned. The fact is that the U.S. does have millions of rounds of chemical ammunition stockpiled at depots here at home and in smaller amounts in West Germany. But the age and condition of those weapons is a matter of concern to many in the military. And the ban that President Nixon 10 years ago put on the production of any new chemical weapons worries them more. Reacting to those fears, the Congress has voted funds for a new chemical weapons plant in Arkansas, but has so far failed to come up with the money to equip that plant. In any case, actual production of new weapons could not begin until the president himself gives the word. And it's not just the production of new weapons that needs that presidential okay. Let's say that they were this afternoon to move against you. Do you have the retaliatory capacity here? No, I do not in the regiment. I'm not authorized any chemical munitions in my basic load. So in spite of the fact that they did it first, you couldn't do anything? No, I could not. In fact, in order to retaliate with chemical weapons, Colonel Crow's commanders in Europe would have to request permission all the way up the line to the President of the United States. And that could take... Uh, longer than perhaps uh, this regiment will be fighting in the initial stages of a war. So chemical weapons are as sensitive as nuclear weapons? Uh, very definitely. American 155 Howitzer crews training in West Germany. These are just standard rounds, but if the president gave the word, within hours, these same weapons could be hurling deadly chemical shells toward enemy lines. That would seem to be a convincing enough deterrent. But many U.S. officials argue that it's not. Our stockpile is aging. It, much of it is obsolete. It's in the wrong kinds of munitions. And I think that a lot of it is stored in the wrong place. There is an urgent need to produce new chemical munitions, the argument goes. But this supposed military need runs smack into American public opinion. If these were real chemical shells instead of ordinary rounds, most American communities wouldn't want them assembled or stored or transported anywhere nearby. Unfortunately, throughout the past, we have always had this stigma attached to this weapon system. William D. of the Army's Chemical Systems Labs says there is an answer to the military's problem. He showed us a model of the so-called binary weapon. What is there about this? particular chemical weapon, this binary weapon, that makes it so much more desirable than the old-fashioned chemical weapons? Well, for one thing, it provides, in fact, what we feel is complete safety. Safety in, in handling it? Safety in handling, safety in transport, safety in storage. 
The reason it's so safe, says D, is that until the round is actually due to be fired, the deadly chemical is split into two relatively harmless components and stored in separate canisters. One of those canisters is actually removed from the round and only inserted in it when the weapon is due to be fired. These two cannot combine until the weapon is fired. I see. And it kills quickly? Kills very quickly. Are you the least bit ashamed of what you do? No, not at all. There's no overtones of Dr. Strange Love playing with his chemicals here? No. No, I don't think so at all. I mean, uh, if a man I... develops a projectile that explodes and kills, that seems to be all right by our standards. But if a man develops what is called a binary explosive shell with chemicals inside, there's something a little a little weird, a little sinister about that. Why, Mr. D? Well, I don't really consider it sinister. I think it's something that we have to do uh, to protect our nation. But as we said, the production of any new chemical weapons requires a presidential okay, and that has not been given. If Perhaps. they've got it, we've got to have it. No, I think if they've got it, I think we've got to have the option to, um, to retaliate in kind rather than to escalate to the next level. And the next level would be nuclear, I would presume. The real reason for making the binaries is not so much increasing of real safety, it's to increase the acceptability of poison gas weapons. It means the making of, of chemical weapons into a more conventional kind of weapon. Harvard professor of biochemistry Matthew Messelson has been leading the fight in this country against new chemical weapons. It's not at all clear that the Soviets have added in any major way to their offensive chemical capability in the past decade, and neither have we. The real question we may be facing is, do we wish to break what is in effect a 10-year halt in the worldwide poison gas arms race? Uh, that question hasn't been focused on. You would like to see chemical weapons disappear both sides? Absolutely. How do we go about that, Ms. Hilbert? I believe that unluckily, because of uh, the ease of making chemical weapons, that you probably cannot get the Soviets to agree to verification that would be adequate. I suspect that in all honesty, you can't get a good disarmament agreement. So we build. So we have to build, in my view. We have a large stockpile of poison gas weapons, and most of it is not becoming unserviceable and will remain serviceable into the indefinite future. The problem is not that we don't have it. The problem is that the Europeans won't let us put it in Europe. And without large stockpiles of weapons in Europe, and particularly here in West Germany, the U.S. would not have a credible offensive threat. It is a fear of huge civilian casualties, says Messelson, that is the reason the West Germans don't want those weapons. The Germans realize that while Soviet and American soldiers would have special gear to protect them, civilians like these would have no protection at all. In fact, there are few open plains for battles to take place safely away from civilian populations in West Germany. So, Colonel, in the event of a chemical attack, it's the civilian populations that are going to get most severely hurt downwind. For instance, this little village over here that's in West Germany, and across the fence, that village over there in East Germany. The civilian population of each of those towns is going to get beat up, and the casualties are going to be how severe? Massive. Complete. Because they're not protected the way Certainly. your troops are. That is correct. They will lose. They will lose virtually everybody in those two villages, certainly. We haven't put any chemical weapons in Germany, even though the supply is said to be very small there, since the 1950s. If we want to put them there, why haven't we? The reason is the Germans will not permit it. And it makes perfect sense. Our and allies are not with us. So what you're suggesting, in effect, is, OK, Let's have a sensible public discussion of the whole issue of chemical warfare. Let's have it now or soon. Yes, and also a sensible government review, which is underway but incomplete. Both of those things. Definitely. We owe it to ourselves to do that. Let me quote to you. General David Jones, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. There's too much pessimism about our current capability. I wouldn't swap our present military capability with that of the Soviet Union. I would. He is the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Secretary of Defense Harold Brown, we remain the military equal of or superior to the Soviet Union. I don't believe that that's accurate. What's wrong with all these fellows whose profession it is, more or less, to understand and shore up the defense capabilities of the United States? They're at odds with you. 
it's also my profession. And I believe I am just as qualified in my area of expertise as they are in theirs. And you feel that chemical warfare, chemical weapons, the offensive capability for the United States, the development of binary weapons is vital to the defense of this country. I believe it's vital to the deterrence of the use of chemical warfare in the next conflict. One gets the impression that chemical warfare is simply a logistics nightmare and, Colonel, it doesn't seem worth the effort for either side. I would totally agree that it certainly is not worth the effort. But uh, we can't afford not to be prepared. And I suppose they feel the same way over there. Precisely. Finally, Republican Senator John Tower, who will be chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee in the new Congress, says that classified information to which he has access proves the United States has fallen behind the Soviet Union in chemical weaponry and that he intends to push for new weapons next year. But, he says, they would be manufactured only as a deterrent. The U.S. policy with chemical weapons would be essentially the same as with nuclear weapons. We'll never use them first, he says. We'll only use them to retaliate. And we want very much to negotiate with the Russians to foreclose the possibility of chemical warfare. Dyer is a journalist and a military historian. He has served as an officer in three navies. This television series is his commentary on the evolution of modern war. In this episode, Dyer shows us how the next great war could begin in the borderland guarded by NATO. He evaluates the chances that NATO can still fight a limited conventional war in Europe. deal we have deduced from the fact that there's been intervals between wars. Hundred miles down that road, two and a half centuries ago, French and German troops were fighting against Austrians and Dutch and British at a battlefield called Blenheim. One and a half centuries ago, about two hours drive over that way, German and Russian and Swedish troops were fighting against Frenchmen at a battlefield near Leipzig. Two generations ago, French and Americans and British and Italians and Canadians and Russians and Australians were fighting against Germans and Austrians and Hungarians and Turks in trenches that extended almost all the way around the horizon. About the time I was learning to walk, American B-17s and British Lancasters were flying over this spot on their way to bomb Dresden. And at the end of that war, they drew this border down through the middle of Germany. It's the odds-on favorite place for where the next world war will start. Here in Europe, the forces of East and West directly face each other, and it's the only place where they do. When they met here in 1945, they were allies. The mood is different now, and the preparations are not for peace. When you've got Soldiers who are busy, who are doing the things that they're going to have to do when the war starts, because the initial things that my troopers will be doing is scouting. And as soon as the major formations are detected, then we will kill them.
Looking east, American NATO soldiers see the frontline troops of communist tyranny. Looking west, Warsaw Pact border guards see the western forces of reaction and imperialism. They all think that they are in a unique confrontation. NATO and the Warsaw Pact are the particular labels this time around, but these are only the latest in a long series of opposing alliances, part of a system which has given us, on average, a major war every 50 years for the past three centuries. Amid the jubilation at the end of the Second World War, the last thing on anyone's mind was that war might ever happen again. No one talked of the war to end all wars, as they had in 1918, but the idea was the same. People believed that things would be different this time. The winners would remain united and ensure a peaceful future. When the wartime leaders arrived at Potsdam in 1945, they thought that their wartime collaboration would continue. But the habitual suspicion of great powers about each other's intentions quickly destroyed their alliance. The smiles soon dissolved, and the victors of the last war were pulled apart by fear. And so, every day now, the Cobra helicopters of the 11th U.S. Armored Cavalry patrol the inter-German border. The alliances of East and West maintain a constant alert here, searching for signs that the Third World War is underway. So far, they've been lucky enough not to find what they've been looking for. On this border, where nothing of real importance has happened in four decades, small events take on a large significance. If we step across the border, uh, and they've, they've had people do this in the past, you know, not realizing it, but nine times out of ten, we're up there, you know, we carry cameras. So they carry cameras. And if we just, you know, just step your foot across that border, and they get your picture, then that is coming down. And then, you know, it takes a, why was this done type of deal. And somebody better have a good answer because we're not, we're just not supposed to do that. That's part of our everyday briefing. We can't, we're not supposed to wave nothing. We're there, they're there. They can do what they so desire. We do what we're told to do. That's the way it works. We have a, a dual mission, really. One of uh, surveilling the east-west German border on a day-to-day -day basis, 365 days a year. Uh, and uh, while doing that, preparing for war, preparing to defend in case that uh, the Warsaw Pact would decide to, to move to the West. I can repeat once more that we don't intend to attack anybody. But if we are attacked by an aggressor, we can and will inflict a devastating retaliatory strike to destroy any aggressor. I think that should be known at any level. Within a few hundred miles on either side of this line lie no less than half the world's total stock of conventional armed forces. That's enough to wipe Europe off the map and maybe trigger the destruction of the rest of the world, too. Over there, stacked up all the way back to the Western military districts of the Soviet Union, there are about 3 million soldiers and 20,000 tanks and combat aircraft. Facing them here in Western Europe are at least 2 million soldiers and over 10,000 tanks and aircraft. If you count in the reserves drawn from NATO and Warsaw Pact countries that extend all the way to the Pacific Ocean in both directions, you're talking about at least 10 million soldiers. It's been nearly 40 years now since really big forces like that fought each other, but the last big war was by far the worst we've ever had. 
The Second World War killed 40 million people and it reduced most of the cities on this continent to rubble without the help of nuclear weapons. Another total war like that, but this time with nuclear weapons, would be at least 10 times worse. So since nobody in his right mind wants to fight a total war with nuclear weapons, we've invented this new category of warfare, conventional war. That is, war using almost everything except nuclear weapons. Any future war between the great powers will probably begin, at least, as a conventional war. And this is where they would fight it. Central Europe, the soldiers hold dress rehearsals for a conventional war. Get up on line! All right, let's go! That would be nothing really new, of course. It's just the old All game right. decked out Get in more right up-to-date and lethal weapons. But in fact, there is a great illusion being played out here, that we could fight a conventional war and survive it. However, the actors on both sides believe in the show, and their preparations for the day the curtain goes up help to convince each side of the other's aggressive intentions. Colonel John Sherman Crow, NATO frontline commander, has definite views on how the Soviets will play out their part. Highly motor, uh, motorized, uh, armored, very volatile, chaotic, ruthless, Mechanized attack with tanks, uh, armored infantry carriers, uh, chemical weapons, uh, tremendous amounts of artillery, indirect fire, and certainly a significant, significant amount of, uh, of air on his part. Like a bad war movie from the 1950s, the Warsaw Pact's own film of its maneuvers manages almost to parody Colonel Crow's view. The Soviets are not 10 feet tall, but in conventional forces, they do have more of everything, all based on a philosophy of make it simple, make it work, and make more of it. These forces are designed and trained to carry out a lightning attack into Western Europe. The Soviets intend to be sure that no matter how a war starts, it will be fought on somebody else's territory, not theirs. So if war comes, they would send wave after wave of men and machines into West Germany in a relentless high-speed drive. It doesn't necessarily mean that they intend to do this, but what NATO cannot ignore is that they are capable of doing it. I believe that the Soviet Union and its allies, Soviet Union, has not the intention of it attacking Europe with the elder leadership which has known the last war, but they have the capability. And intentions can very quickly change. You, you may remember a certain prime minister coming back from a conference waving a slip of paper, paper, peace in our century, peace in our time. Well, that was about 10 months before the, 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 the last world war. So, and, and so we must take into account capabilities. Taking capabilities into account means NATO plans concentrate on stopping the kind of attack the Soviets could make. The West Germans, just like the Soviets, do not want to see a war fought in their homeland. So to keep them happy, NATO has devised a strategy called forward defense. Uh, my mission is to defend central region of Allied Command Europe as far forward as possible. That means immediately at the inner German border or the German Czech border. And we will do that immediately there. 
The trouble with forward defense is that it doesn't make military sense. The normal way of dealing with a massive tank attack is to set up a very deep defended zone to give the defender a chance to wear down and eventually stop the attacking tanks. That would hardly suit the West Germans. Almost half their country would be overrun before a Soviet attack could be stopped. So for political reasons, NATO plans to make its defense along a line very close to the frontier. There are two things wrong with this. One is that it probably wouldn't work because the defended zone would be too shallow. The other is that to the Soviets, forward defense doesn't look like defense at all. The idea of this forward defense is to deploy NATO forces as close as possible to the Soviet frontier so that in the case of necessity, they could act on our territory. This concept, this doctrine, this strategy, whatever it's called, is defensive in name only. The people in the Kremlin are not stupid and they're quite logical in their thinking on, on these matters. We say that we have no plans to defend forward of that line, in other words, to invade East Germany. And uh, uh, I believe I can say with perfect confidence that there are no such plans. They'd be dynamite. We have no such plans. Very well, the Russian planners would say, but what provision have you made for defending in depth the other way? And when they look at this, they say, how uh, are we to believe your assertions that you've made no preparations to take the only other alternative, which is defense by forward action, DDR, when you've made no preparation for defense in depth? And what's wanted is a counter-penetration force in depth in the North German plane which can fight the classic battle in depth uh, when forward defense breaks down, which all linear defense, unless you've got overwhelming superiority in forces along the line, must do. If NATO's thin forward defense does collapse before a Soviet attack, the Western Alliance has only one answer, to use its battlefield nuclear weapons even at the risk of starting the escalation to all-out nuclear war. As for the Soviets, well, this is a Warsaw Pact production, but it's almost worthy of an epic from Cecil B. DeMille. these tanks are the reason the Soviets are less likely to use nuclear weapons first. They have superior strength in conventional weapons. They've planned it this way, and it's their history that's made them do it. If you want to know why the Russians now own almost half the tanks in the world, give a thought to what happened here. Leningrad is Russia's second city, and during the Second World War, it was besieged for 900 days. Hardly a building was left standing, and 600,000 Leningraders died. The Russians are determined not to let that happen again. They're being silly, of course. What threatens this city nowadays is nuclear weapons, and all the tanks in the world can't stop them from reaching here. But like most people, the Russians are trapped by their past. The whole military balance in Europe is frozen history. The Soviets have all those tanks in Central Europe because back in the early post-war days, that was the only counter threat they could offer to the West's overwhelming superiority in nuclear weapons. But since the Soviets now have nuclear weapons too, along with their tanks, the West has hedged its bets by building up its conventional forces in Europe as well. It's no wonder that each side is deeply suspicious of the other. So the Soviets also have nuclear missiles scattered among their conventional weapons in Europe. That doesn't stop the old game from going on as before, at least in the soldiers' heads. There's a military doublethink that pretends the nuclear weapons aren't there and that conventional war is safe. The trouble is we no longer really know how a conventional war might work out either because we haven't fought a big one in a very long time. Because wars don't go on all the time, whereas technological change does, every new war now starts with a lot of untried technology around. 
So it's perfectly understandable that our predictions about the next war are often wrong. Back in 1914, people thought that the war would be a few big decisive battles and over in time for the troops to be home for Christmas. But it didn't work out like that. In 1939, people thought it would be like the First World War all over again. Trenches, attrition, stalemate. But it wasn't. And we too think that we know what a conventional war in Europe would be like today. Basically like the Second World War, except at an even faster pace, and maybe with a few new weapons like nerve gas thrown in. The generals are well aware, in private, that our assumptions about the shape of a European conventional war are a house of cards. It's a quite elaborate house, but the cards which make it up are no more than a series of educated guesses about how the technology would work out in practice. Because nobody really knows what would happen when all of these weapons are used in large numbers, in combination with each other, in real battle. by the center! Quick march! <laughs> In the absence of real battle, the only way of trying to calculate how things might work out is to hold exercises. And that's what both sides do every autumn. The generals want to believe that they can fight a conventional war successfully. Nuclear weapons would, after all, mean the skills they've spent a lifetime developing are irrelevant. At the opening ceremonies of the NATO exercises, a little saber rattling precedes the serious business of playing at conventional war. It's indeed an honor and a pleasure for me to welcome all of you to this inauguration of Autumn Forge 1980. Take, taking place from northern Norway to the other flank in Turkey. Confirming our ability and our willingness to repel aggression wherever it might occur in Allied Command Europe. Paratroops of the U.S. 82nd Airborne Division arrived direct from Fort Bragg, North Carolina to take part in these elaborate and expensive war games. They join up with soldiers from Britain, Germany, and half a dozen other NATO countries, and for a couple of weeks they pretend they're fighting a real war. Uh, tango uh, wrong, zero. Tango one, you are to take up a counter penetration position on the west. I say again, the west of the small bag position. Over. Tango one, tango two, tango three, move now out. They split into attacking and defending sides. They're given objectives to gain and positions to defend and then they fight it out. Was that Bravo Echo Charlie? Uni Bravo Echo Uniform Charlie. Bravo Echo, Echo Uniform. Charlie. Uniform Alpha for what? Yeah, I'm going to Why not? Can you get on? Because nobody dies, except by accident. It's war with the consequences neatly removed. The experience of Colonel Roderick Jones of the Queen's Royal Irish Hussars is fairly typical. He's been a professional soldier for 22 years, and although he's seen minor actions in distant parts of the world, he's never been in a full-scale war. Neither have any of the 550 men and 47 tanks he has under his command. The tanks are not the tanks of World War II, and one of the things that makes them different is their price tag. A modern tank costs $3 million, Colonel Roderick Jones's entire salary for about 100 years. A tank 
Nine. Is that one of your call signs over by that red barn ever? Roger. Roger, Roger. For your three million, you get a machine that can keep moving on today's lethal battlefield and fire accurately on the move over a distance of about two miles. What this means for Roderick Jones and his men is that their battlefield will be a pretty empty place. They will fight inside machines against other men inside machines. Most of the killing will be distant and impersonal, a long way from the days of hand-to-hand -hand combat. was a time when human endurance dictated the length of a battle. Fighting stopped when the soldiers were too exhausted to carry on. Now, if the machinery can keep going, the men are expected to keep pace. With electronic night fighting equipment, men would remain in action almost continuously for as much as six days. The plans are unreal, but they're matched by the surreal incidents of the maneuvers. The tank ahead has been killed by Corporal Coffey of the Orange Force, acting as stand-ins for the Warsaw Pact. There are rules to this game, and the rules say that once dead, a tank should move out of the way of its attacker and let him continue his advance. That's what Corporal Coffey has in mind. But tank number 72, manned by Americans, has other ideas. So as in all good games, when the opposing sides disagree, the umpire gets to arbitrate. I'll bust on, I'll take the lead. What we're gonna do, let this troop straight on, okay? The orange force is gonna continue its advance. Right now. Right now. Right down these trails. Right down this trail. You're killing me. Well, I don't mind. I'm an umpire. Start it up. Can you, any chance you might be able to move that? Otherwise, I think you might end up tin. At the end of the day on exercise, win or lose, you walk away to see another dawn. But that doesn't mean these men are unaware of what lies ahead for them if they ever get into a real battle. At the points where the Soviets might concentrate their tanks to break through, the scale and pace of the destruction would be almost unimaginable. And those points are pretty obvious to anyone who can read a map. According to a very senior American general, this valley is the site of the biggest tank battle in the history of the world. It's a battle that has not been fought, but this area, the Hünfeld approach to the Fulda Gap, lies on the shortest route between the East German border and the Rhine. If the Russian tanks ever do roll west, the terrain will funnel them into this valley, and this is where NATO will make it stand. In military parlance, this valley is a killing zone. If the Soviets did attack, several thousand tanks would come through this gap. The local odds would be around 10 to 1 in favor of the attackers. NATO hopes to deal with the onslaught by setting up killing zones near the border where NATO troops would fire from protected positions at the Soviet tanks as they come through in the open. Uh, this is six wall I think you're about to get flanked. But the Warsaw Pact has more men in tanks further east in Poland and Russia who'd be following on after the first wave. So NATO's staff officers recently came up with something new called follow-on forces attack. There'd be no West German tanks heading for Warsaw. Instead, using massive air attacks and high-tech weapons like missiles that can tell a tank from a truck, NATO would strike deep into East Germany to prevent Soviet reinforcements from getting to the battle and making the odds even worse. Even if that works, the losses among NATO troops would be very heavy, and there's no certainty that they could stop a Soviet attack. The soldiers know very well, even from their experience on exercises, that they probably won't live very long in battle. We started out in this village here, this is a big combat team, we started off with 11 tanks, um, 8 
armoured personnel carriers. That was two sections, uh, two platoons of infantry. We've got uh, guided weapon systems down the road there. And we had, the umpires knocked us out five, five tanks. And both platoon commanders. So you, you lost five out of 11 in a single day? In the space of 30 minutes. Is that normal? It would be if they come at us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is that, that would be about right. If you get so many tanks coming towards us, I mean, we had about three combat teams come at us then. That's about 30 to 40 tanks uh, that come at us, and that that would be normal. Half our force would be knocked out, but we did stop. Uh, normally, we were expected to last in a tank battle two hours. And that is our, that is our expected life, expect to see war of a tank crew two hours. I would say less than that. I would say you were talking about minutes. Uh, this, of course, can change varying on the circumstance and all this, which we hope we'll never find out. But generally, they say minutes, not hours. Um, I think um, my tank commander, whoever it was, who tells you he was gonna, only going to last two hours, um, that it was being unduly gloomy. They may disagree on the exact time, but everyone agrees it would happen very fast. And sooner or later, one side will start to lose. What would happen then? In one NATO war game, when Soviet tanks started breaking through, the NATO response was to use a single nuclear weapon as a sort of warning to go no further. But the soldiers playing the Soviet side felt they couldn't let themselves be blackmailed so they answered with one of their own nuclear weapons. The escalation from there to all-out nuclear war took only a couple of days. Nobody has fought ever in a nuclear environment, and so it's conjecture on both sides. Um, we think that in our prepared positions and in our armored vehicles, which um, maintain a, um, a nuclear, biological, and chemically free environment within them uh, through filters, uh, that we could do pretty well in nuclear environment, but it's all conjecture from both sides. Things would be much less healthy for people who are not inside tanks. And a major defeat in the land war is only one of the outcomes that could bring nuclear weapons into play. There are others. For example, what might happen if NATO just ran out of conventional weapons? What if there were no more planes for these pilots to fly? If tanks are the cart horses of a modern European war, these men ride the racehorses, single combat fighters. They're the 20th century's answer to medieval knights going to war in $23 million worth of armor. Uh... Every day, some of them are on alert. Every day at some point, the alert flights are scrambled. And they can never be quite sure, 100% sure, that this time it's not for real. Their job in a real war would be crucial. Attacking ground forces and striking at supply lines and stopping enemy aircraft from doing the same thing to their side. That much hasn't changed from World War II but what they're flying has. technology has taken over warfare and fighter planes are out there on the leading edge. They're beautiful to look at and the pilots love flying them, but there is a catch. Like all high technology goods, they're very delicate, which is likely to cause problems when you consider the environment they'd be operating in during wartime.
This is an F-15 Eagle, and it's a magnificent machine, probably the best fighter in the world. Its engines are so powerful that it can stand on its tail and accelerate straight up. Its missiles can reach out and destroy an enemy aircraft 20 miles away. The 20 millimeter cannon in its wing fires 100 rounds a second. But the heart of the plane is its electronics. It has a radar that can pick up enemy aircraft 50 miles away and tell you everything about them except what the enemy pilot had for breakfast. The data processing equipment is so complicated that one of the main computer's jobs is running the other computers. There's only about a hundred of these aircraft in Europe, but each one is so effective that it can probably do the job of maybe 25 or 30 World War II fighters. The only possible drawback is that if you start losing these machines in combat, well, the current rate of production of F-15s in the United States is seven per month. It takes about 18 months to build an F-15. The $23 million cost is a measure of the materials and man hours, especially the man hours, that go into its construction. About the same amount of factory space is given over to the construction of military aircraft in the United States now as was devoted to the same purpose in Germany in World War II. But in 1944, Germany was building 3,000 planes a month and losing them at about the same rate. Current American production is about 40 per month. Bigger, better planes, but ones with their own problems. It's a big airplane. We're used to driving big cars. It's a big, powerful airplane, and uh, sometimes it's being criticized for that. Because it's big and overpowered and very large, carries a tremendous amount of fuel, has a very big radar, has a very roomy cockpit, has a lot of range. But uh, it also does a lot of things. Hangar queens, they call them. Being able to do a lot of things means that these aircraft have a lot of equipment that can go wrong. For about one-third of their working life, these planes are out of order even in peacetime. Hardly a record that would inspire confidence even in your family car. Go guns on the thing and, uh, and then go reticle stiffen and see what the reticle does. Okay, stand back. Where does it go when it gets a track? Track test lock on. I mean, that tell, would tell if it's going to work. Or... Tonic, they're going to uh, three back at airplanes. So just go ahead and uh, shut it down. Get a hold of the line truck out there. Tell them what the problem was with the uh, HUD. See if they can get some avionics people on it. Uh, it's uh, going to go to Turkey. What's causing the problem here is the HUD, the head up display. Okay, sir. Uh, no problem. I'll write it up then. Thank you. Okay. I'm on the way back in. Okay. We have in the F-15 and most contemporary airplanes have what we call a head-up display. It's a very sophisticated gun sight. Not unlike gun sights that have been in fighter airplanes for the last 20 or 30 years. It's a big piece of glass and you look through it all the time. But instead of just having a little pipper or dot that you put on the enemy when you're going to shoot a gun, it reads out everything that has to do with uh, basic flight instruments, your height, altitude, and your speed, etc. And it puts up there symbology for weapons attack. Well, the first time somebody sees one of those things, they think it's very cluttered. I'm used to looking outside and have a lot of garbage up there that is going to bother me with my normal vision. Well, then after a little while, they look at it again, they begin to not see the things they don't want, and they only see the things they do. Then pretty soon, they can consciously look through it without seeing any of that information and see the targets that they always saw before. But now when they want to know some information about that target that they're looking at, they can just think for a minute and see the other number, whereas before they had to look someplace else or take their focus off the adversary and go look in the cockpit for this information before. At first, they were very reluctant to accept that and justifiably, but after they got a little bit more exposure to it, they found out, hey, this is not too bad at all. All this marvelous equipment and all the drawbacks it brings with it is not just an American or Western problem. The Russians have to plan for war in the same technological environment. So more and more they've been pushed in the same direction. 
They too now have aircraft that will do astounding things when they can get them out of the hangar and as long as they can guide them to their targets, which may not be for very long. If the two sides go to war, there's going to be an enormous traffic jam in the air over Central Europe. Put thousands of combat planes in the air at the same time, and all shooting at each other, attacking ground targets, and being attacked by ground-based missiles. Add in the fact that the air bases and the control centers like this, which keep track of the aircraft, will be among the first targets to go in a war, and pretty soon, nobody will know where anybody is. Okay, I'll check. I'll check, thanks, I'm a leader. Did you scramble? We were out for four five. Four five. Did you scramble? The TC is right there. All he's doing is he's going to pick some other body. Yes. Sir. Zero eight five five. Go big Ed. Brooke Bird zero three seven and one two six. We're going to land here. Now I'm told that one two six didn't land. Right. And they don't. Part one two six is still there. Now, now I'm told that he is back in Bovisham. Okay, well. When you get through the bullshit and you find out what's happening now, because I, I thought they were going to swap out a tub. A modern fighter aircraft on full power can cross West Germany in eight minutes. Even in peacetime, it's a full-time job making sure the planes don't run into each other and that they all get home to the right base. We've got the best airplane, and the airplane uh, will do the job. We've got to make sure then that the pilots and the ground crews and everybody that supports that, the command and control system, can get us out there and get us to the target and uh, keep us from getting shot down by our own airplanes or our own ground system. That's uh, one of the very complicated things uh, that is, uh, has gotten a lot of attention. We're confident it, it can work, but it, it takes a lot of coordination. The combat environment is becoming so complex and lethal that there's a real possibility of running out of your most important weapons quite quickly. This A-10, for example, is designed to destroy Russian tanks, which is a rather dangerous occupation. But the men who fly the planes habitually look on the bright side. That's exactly right. And this, this airplane was designed to take hits and survive. I mean, there is going to be an awful lot of flack over about yeah. these days. There is. There's going to be a lot of AAA and a lot of SAMs. AAA? Anti-aircraft artillery. Uh -huh. But you reckon that you can, I mean, you're going low and slow over whole armored yeah. divisions and things, and you reckon with those things you've got a decent chance of getting out? Yeah. yeah. Sure do. We're going to take losses, sure, but every airplane is. Um, it's, you know, something you've got to live with, but uh, there's enough redundancy in the airplane that even if we take a hit, the pilot can probably get out. And I've, everybody's got total confidence. It's got one of the best ejection seats around. Yeah, but the pilot gets out and the plane goes down, but I'm talking about running out of planes, really. Well, I don't know. I'm not one of the big planners. I just fly them. Yeah. An American aircraft manufacturer recently remarked that the next time it will be a come-as-you-are war. The weapons that have already been built on the first day of the war will be the only ones you have. When they've been destroyed, that's it. Uh, the production lines for today's kinds of weapons couldn't possibly be expanded fast enough to replace even a fraction of the losses. All our expectations about a modern conventional war assume that aircraft like this and tanks and guns and electronic equipment of a similar level of sophistication will be around in large numbers. It's a safe enough assumption for the first week of a European war, but by the third week, there might not be many of these weapons left, and nobody knows what would happen then. One thing that is likely to happen is that chemical weapons will be used. You can't see them or smell them, but breathe a little or get a microscopic droplet on your skin and you die. And you do not know you're dying until it's too late to do anything about it. The symptoms at first are quite innocent, but headaches are followed by convulsions, involuntary defecation, floods of mucus that almost drown you, and finally paralysis. Your chest muscles simply stop working and you suffocate. There are many reasons why you get a more horrified reaction to the idea of constructing chemical weapons. 
I think in some senses it goes back to the Middle Ages and the feeling that chemicals are witchcraft. Um, there's something you can't see. There's something that will kill people without you knowing what is happening. Uh, it's that sort of a magic that I think creates very much of the horror. The Warsaw Pact and NATO both deny any intention of using chemical weapons, except if the other side uses them first. But the other side might just do that, so they both hold regular exercises where their soldiers scramble into the cumbersome gear that would give them at least some protection. And both sides keep huge stockpiles of nerve gas just in case. Well, chemicals are considered by the Soviets to be almost a normal part of a conventional war. Not quite, but they are viewed as an inter intermediate sort of weapon. As a matter of fact, one of the Soviet doctrinal statements on this goes back to their quoting of a Harold Brown 1963 document where he referred to chemicals as an intermediate weapon between conventional and nuclear. Wearing protective suits makes everything the troops do much harder. In fact, simply communicating while wearing this gear is so difficult that in chemical exercises, commanders have been known to throw stones at their men to get their attention. Physically, it has its drawbacks. It, you are isolated, you're inside very constrictive, restrictive clothing, and you have a difficult time drinking. In, virtually impossible unless you can get out of the area to eat. There are other problems that'll go with it that go without saying. It's just not, not a simple process. But then, you know, what you're dealing with is a question of survival. If the soldiers get their suits on and survive, the major job becomes decontamination. The vehicles that have been contaminated by droplets of gas are untouchable until they've been washed off, and nobody knows where the vast amounts of water would come from in a combat zone. One NATO plan talked of using West German civilian car washes. Presumably, tank commanders will be issued with five mark coins, at least those of them left alive. As for the suits, you can't take them off until they've been washed down thoroughly with more water, and then you take them off very carefully. It's all a hopelessly domestic response to what will be anything but a domestic situation. Uh, the chemical casualties themselves, if they weren't treated immediately, would not reach us at all. I see. Yeah. So that someone will have to have dealt with them before they, yes. they get treated? Yes. We, we, we carry, with our respirators, we, we, we carry oxyme tablets, which are a, a prophylaxis against uh, chemical attack, especially the nerve gas. And we carry atropine, which is an immediate treatment. After uh, you've been exposed? After you've been exposed. But the trick is not to get exposed in the first place. Yeah, rather yeah. difficult sometimes. Rather actually. difficult sometimes, yeah. yes. But at least the soldiers have suits and oxine and atropine. The civilians living downwind from the battlefield don't. And clouds of nerve gas will drift silently and invisibly on the wind for up to a hundred miles, bringing mass death to their towns and villages. The battlefield use of chemical weapons in Europe would inevitably mean civilian casualties in the millions. And we're still talking about what former U.S. Defense Secretary Harold Brown and the Russians have described as an intermediate weapon. What about the real thing? What about nuclear weapons? Since we suspect that conventional war won't work, we also prepare for the nuclear war. First in the battlefield, soon after in our homes, that's the likely next step. NATO, for example, would almost certainly start using nuclear weapons if its conventional defenses collapse. 
And to keep the Russians worried, NATO has a doctrine called flexible response, which goes much further. There is no such thing as a pre-planned escalation which necessarily must follow in steps each other, so to speak, first a conventional war and then a nuclear war. This would be very much against our philosophy of flexible response. Flexible response means that the enemy faces a completely uncalculable risk. It might even be that we use nuclear weapons from the outset. If the political decision is made for that, the military is prepared to do it. The side who are using nuclear weapons, what do they want? They want to destroy the enemy, to gain the advantage. But by doing that, they force the enemy to use nuclear weapons too. So the war will escalate to a level of general nuclear war. This is the dialectic of war and the structure of armed forces nowadays. In the last war, we didn't have nuclear weapons, so they weren't used. But now we have nuclear weapons. And no side will accept defeat before it uses all the weapons it has. All the weapons it has. There are now 10,000 nuclear warheads in Europe, and if the dialectics of war mean anything, it probably won't be very long after the first shot until they come into use. And from battlefield nuclear weapons to city killers is a very short step. The assumption that you can control a nuclear war uh, is pure fantasy. From the moment the first nuclear weapons released on the European battlefield, you open Pandora's box, and you don't know what's coming out. But one thing you can count on is that there will be a very high probability of early and steep escalation into the strategic all out exchange that nobody wants. So you mustn't use the things. Even before the escalation starts, the soldiers will find the nuclear battlefield an uninhabitable place. The old game will be over. If they started using nuclear weapons, what kind of casualties? The, the, the mind boggles at the thought. I mean, we know what, what difficulties we had over the last two days with the sort of throughput we had, which was only up to about 50 an hour. But when you're talking about thousands and thousands of casualties, one could only, I think, treat those which were simply treated, immediately treated, and with a very high chance of survival which would be very much the minority. And the rest just... Would, if they didn't perish straight away, would perish very shortly afterwards. Because the treatment for, for radiation, high doses of radiation, well, there is no treatment. But if you start using them, we lose. We all lose. Yes, I know we do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. now the people of this village have watched the tanks roll up towards the border each autumn and come back again a couple of weeks later. These exercises have become a kind of ritualized activity and every year the ritual gets a little bit more expensive and a little bit more bizarre. We've turned Central Europe into a kind of game park where we're trying to preserve an endangered species, conventional war, because we're desperately trying to stave off the alternative, a return to total war nuclear total war. These soldiers aren't fools. They know perfectly well that the efficient, modern, cost-effective way to stop tanks isn't to set up an elaborate killing zone. You simply drop a nuclear bomb on them. Better yet, you drop nuclear weapons on the cities where the people who built the tanks live. That's total war in the 20th century tradition. But if we fight another total war like that, it's not just those soldiers who die. 
you and I die too, and pretty well everybody we ever met. If these soldiers ever have to go into battle, we'll order them to fight a conventional war for as long as possible. The problem is that this distinction we've created between conventional and nuclear war is in the end an artificial distinction, and probably a pretty flimsy one. If either side started to win a conventional war, the other would bring out its nuclear weapons. But a stalemate would also bring strong pressures to escalate. So, win, lose, or draw, conventional war in Europe leads back towards nuclear war, probably in a matter of only a couple of weeks. And once the first battlefield nuclear weapon has been fired in Europe, we've passed the last clearly defined barrier to nuclear war, and we're heading straight for the Holocaust. This program was made possible by this station and other public television stations nationwide.